scary as it is, there are a lot of murder cases that haven't been solved. Sometimes, it is hard for us to accept the court's decision, even after it has been made. There are some very public murders in this video that shocked the whole world. In today's video, we're taking a look at the top five infamous murders. Keep your heart close. These murders are infamous for a reason. You don't want to be caught off guard, so keep your heart close. Number one, Dorothy Stratton. The model was found while working at a Dairy Queen in Vancouver, Canada, where she was born Dorothy Ruth Hoogstraten in 1960. Several news sources say that Paul Snyder was a Canadian bar promoter who wanted to make it to Hollywood. When he met Dorothy in 1978, he fell in love with her right away. He finally persuaded her that a picture where she would be naked would help her get a job in Los Angeles, and things took off from there. Hugh Hefner asked her to come to see the Playboy Mansion and see what might be in store for her after seeing her pictures. In August 1979, she married Paul two months before becoming a playmate. However, Paul's name began to fade as Dorothy became more well-known. Paul did crazy things that her friends didn't like, and in November 1980, Playmate of the Month, Gina Kioff told a BC News that he wasn't afraid to cheat on his wife at work. This is when Paul and Dorothy met Steve. Steve was just starting to make the Chippendales a huge business. Oxygen says, Dorothy came up with the idea of giving the male strippers the standard collar and cuffs, and her husband became one of the first business partners in the now iconic company. Dorothy was named Playmate of the Year at the beginning of 1980. They both got parts in the 1981 movie, They All Laughed, which came out around the same time. Peter Bogdanovich directed the movie as well. He met the model earlier that year and fell in love with her. Newsweek says that Dorothy and Paul's marriage was so unstable that in June 1980, she asked for a physical and financial split. Paul is said to have hired a private investigator to find out the truth because she thought the Oscar-winning director was having an affair with her. On August 14, 1980, everything came to a head. Several news sources said Dorothy met with Paul to finalize the terms of their divorce. Oxygen also said that Paul raped the model and then shot her with a new pistol he had bought. He killed himself not long after the murder. Peter set up for her body to be burned five days after she was killed, according to the Village Voice. He also wrote a personal statement about how much he loved her before she died too soon. Dorothy Stratton was as talented and intelligent an actress as she was beautiful and she was very beautiful indeed in every way imaginable, most especially in her heart. She and I fell in love during our picture and had planned to be married as soon as her divorce was final. The loss to her parents, her sister and brother, my children, her friends, and me is bigger than we can imagine, he said. Many people have been changed for the better by Dorothy, even if they only knew her for a short time. Dorothy saw the world with love and thought that everyone was good at heart. Number 2. Sharon Tate In the early hours of August 9, 1969, Sharon Tate, who played Valley of the Dolls, was at her rented house in Los Angeles with actor Jay Sebring, writer Wojciech Frykowski, and his girlfriend, Abigail Folger, who is the daughter of Peter Folger and Harris to the Folger's Coffee. Wealth Tate, who was 26 years old, was more than eight months pregnant with her first kid. She got married to director Roman Polanski the year before. There was a murder while the director of Rosemary's Baby was out of the country, leaving his wife with Frykowski and Folger. The house on CLO Drive was known to Charles Manson because it had been rented by music producer Terry Melcher who had thought about giving the cult leader a recording contract, but ultimately decided not to. Manson started his group, called the Manson Family in the early 1960s. Along with about 100 other people, the group lived an unusual life and used drugs like benzodrine and hallucinogens like LSD. 
Most of Manson's followers were young women from good families who were drawn to the hippie lifestyle and community living at the famous Fan Ranch in California. Manson quickly turned them into radicals. Many people in the group were sure he was Jesus Christ coming to Earth, and they believed everything he said about how there would soon be a terrible race war. Manson and the family did a lot of bad things, like murder, attack, theft, and damage to property on the street. They were very unlike Christ. Manson told Charles Tex Watson, one of his followers, and a few other group members to go to Tate's property on August 9 and kill everyone there as gruesomely as you can. Watson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Linda Kasabian, who are also members of the family, went to the house. Even though she was there, she didn't directly help kill anyone. When the group members got to the house, they killed Stephen Parent, 18, who was there to see his friend William Gerritsen, who was taking care of the estate. After the killing, Watson, Atkins, and Krenwinkel broke into the house while Kasabian stayed outside to keep an eye on things. To get their victims inside, they made them meet in the living room and then tied Tate and Sebring up and slung them over the ceiling beams. Sebring was killed by being shot and stabbed several times. Even though Frykowski and Folger were able to get out of the house, Krenwinkel and Watson quickly caught and killed them. Tate asked the family members inside the house to let her live long enough to give birth to her unborn child, but they didn't listen. She died after being stabbed 16 times by Atkins and Watson. Atkins wrote pig on the front door with Tate's blood as the murderers left the house. This was likely an answer to Manson's request to leave a sign something witchy. The next night, Manson went looking for more people to kill with Watson, Atkins, Krenwinkle, Kasabian, Leslie Van Houten, and Stephen Clem Grogan, who were also family members. They went after the home of grocery store manager Lino LeBianca and his wife, Rosemary, in Los Angeles. Woman and man were taken by Manson and Watson. Manson then left the scene with Atkins, Kasabian, and Grogan. Watson, Van Houten, and Krenwinkel stayed put because Manson told them to. They stabbed the couple to death and wrote on the walls in their blood. People were carefree in the swinging 60s, but the killings put an end to that. The ritualistic nature of the killings has been blamed for the rise of satanic fear. Even though the police weren't doing their best, by the end of the year, all of the killers had been caught after being detained on separate charges. Many of them said that the killings weren't because of who the victims were, but because of the house at that address, which had been rented by Terry Melcher, who was thought to have insulted Manson. Number 3. Gianni Versace. 20 years ago, South Beach, Florida, wasn't a place where people could get up early. A fashion crowd of models, singers, actors, and bohemians ruled the scene, and people liked to party on the beach and dance in the clubs. As long as a bohemian wore a G-string and rode rollerblades, they were okay. But there were driven and ambitious people in this world, and designer Gianni Versus, who is sort of the mayor of South Beach, was one of the most successful. The Italian design mogul, who was 50 years old at the time, was up at 6 a.m. on July 15, 1997. He called Milan and did more work. Then he sneaked out of his house and went to the news cafe, which was only three blocks away. Versace bought a coffee at the Busy Ocean Drive restaurant, greeted the manager, and picked up copies of Vogue and the New Yorker. He then went back to Casa Casuarina, the luxurious house he'd spent millions of dollars buying and fixing up. He went up five marble steps and put the key into the iron gate's lock. A man with dark hair, knee-length shorts, a gray tank top, a baseball cap, and a backpack rushed up the same concrete steps at that exact moment. Andrew Cunanan killed Gianni Versace by shooting him twice. Afterward, 
He turned around and walked away without a fuss. Kunanan, who was 27 years old, was already wanted and a suspect in four killings in three states. His mother called him a high-class homosexual prostitute. He had been hiding in Miami for more than two months. He was quickly identified by police as the person who killed Versace, and the media called him a serial killer, and the search for him took up most of the news. While the cops searched the Miami area, Donatella and Santo Versace, who were devastated, flew in from Milan. They took Gianni's body and went back to Italy. On July 22, 1997, one week after he was killed, Versace was given a funeral fit for a prince at the Duomo, Milan's impressive 14th century church. Outside, camera crews were vying for space as more than 2,000 people crowded into the memorial. Many of them were wearing verses. They included Naomi Campbell, who was his favorite model, Anna Wintour and Karl Lagerfeld, who were his fashion industry heroes, and Princess Diana, who was his most famous customer. Elton John and Sting, two of his closest famous friends, sang The Lord is My Shepherd, a psalm chosen by Versace's team at the end of the service. As the song ended, the church was filled with the sound of people crying. The sound of gunshots that day broke the hot quiet of Ocean Drive. In some ways, they have never gone away. The crime had almost the same cultural impact as other high-profile murders, like the killing of Sharon Tate by Charles Manson's family in 1969 and the deaths of Jose and Kitty Menendez in Beverly Hills in 1989. It combined cruel violence with the exclusive and rare world of fame, showing in an instant how helpless the rich and famous can be. But these horrible crimes are done for a reason, no matter how crazy or cruel that reason is. Versace, on the other hand, has kept a why a secret. Kunanan didn't tell anyone why he killed Versace and didn't write anything down. A lot of people thought he had killed a lot of people to find out who gave him HIV. But Kunanan didn't have the virus, as shown by an autopsy. Family members of Versace have always said that the designer did not have HIV. Drew Kunanan's body was found in a houseboat off of Miami Beach on July 23, 1997. This was less than two weeks after Versace was killed. He had killed himself with the same gun that he had used to kill Versace and the other three people. The national manhunt ended when Kunanan killed himself, but the search for answers began and has continued for 20 years. Number 4. The Black Dahlia As the Black Dahlia, Elizabeth Short was a wanted actor who wanted fame more than anything else. She had no idea how she would get it since she was the victim of a horrible crime that had been going on for decades in America. A young mother and her three-year-old daughter found the body of Elizabeth Short on January 15, 1947. Short was 22 years old at the time. It looked like her body had been cruelly cut in half and was lying in the grass in a Los Angeles suburb. Her body was cut in half with two pieces about a foot apart. Her innards were taken out, folded, and then put back into her stomach. Pieces of her skin had been cut off, and her arms had marks from being tied together. Her whole body had been drained of blood. But maybe the worst thing about her was her face. The killer had cut it open from the edges of both lips to her ears, giving her a smile like the Joker. After a week, someone calling from the Los Angeles Examiner said they were the killer. He said that he had kept trinkets and would send them over in the mail. He did what he said he would do. Four days later, a mail worker brought out a letter that was meant for the examiner. The package had Elizabeth Short's birth certificate, business cards, pictures, and contact book. But as with many other well-known killings in the past, the media circus that followed only made things more confusing for the police. There were so many tips that it was hard for the police to tell the difference between the truth and the lies. 
They questioned 12 possible suspects and listened to more than 60 people who said they were the killers, but they were not able to catch anyone. Number five, the Lizzie Borden killings. Lizzie Borden, who was born on July 19, 1860, was put on trial for killing her stepmother, Abby Borden, and father, Andrew Borden. Even though she wasn't found guilty, no one else was, and she is still famous for killing them. The killings took place in Fall River, Massachusetts, on August 4, 1892. The bodies of her father and stepmother were found on the couch, in the living room, and in the bedroom upstairs. A little over 30 minutes after her dad got home from running errands in the morning, Lizzie said she found his body. Not long after that, Bridget Sullivan, the maid, found Lizzie's stepmother's body. Both people were killed by being hit in the head with a hatchet. Some people said that Lizzie and her stepmother did not get along well and had a fight years before the murder. Lizzie and Emma Borden, her sister, were also known to fight with their dad. They didn't agree with his choices about how to divide their family's land. She also said that her father killed the pigeons that lived in the family barn. The whole family got sick right before the killings happened. Since Mr. Borden wasn't liked by many people in town, Mrs. Borden thought foul play was going on. It turned out that they got food poisoning from eating contaminated meat, even though Mrs. Borden thought they had been poisoned. After they died, the contents of their stomach were checked for toxins, but no results were reached. The killings of Andrew and Abby Borden are, without a doubt, two of the most famous crimes in American history. For the Borden family, August 4, 1892, started out like any other day. Andrew had to go into town in the morning for some business. He left his 32-year-old Sunday school teacher, Lizzie, at home with his wife, Abby, and Bridget Sullivan, who cleans the house for the family. When Andrew got home later that day, his wife was gone. He was told by Lizzie that Abby had gotten a note and gone to see a friend. Abby, on the other hand, wasn't anywhere. That very moment, she was just upstairs, lying dead in a pool of her own blood. Lizzie sat down with her dad on the couch and helped him relax. But Bridget wouldn't leave the house, even though she told her about a sale at a nearby department store. She told Lizzie that she wasn't feeling well. She went to her bedroom, sat down, and fell asleep. Sullivan's time to relax was cut short by a fit of yelling and shouting. Lizzie screamed that someone had killed her dad. Andrew was found bloody and dead on the couch as Sullivan ran out the door. His face was so badly changed that it was impossible to tell who he was. In a panic, Lizzie realized that her stepmother, Abby, should have come home by now. She asked Sullivan to look for her upstairs. On the other hand, the search went quickly. Sullivan had only gone halfway up the stairs before she found her dead from a hatchet wound. His wife had been hit with a hatchet 19 times and her husband had been hit 11 times. At first, Lizzie wasn't thought to be involved in the killings but she was arrested and put on trial for them after a friend saw her burning one of her stained dresses. In the end, the court dropped the charges against Lizzie. They didn't think the female Sunday school teacher could have ever done such horrible things because there wasn't enough solid proof against her. The defense used witnesses to give Borden an alibi. A lot of different ideas have been put forward about what could have happened. Some say it was Lizzie Borden, others say it was Sullivan, and still others say it was all of the girls. But the puzzle hasn't been solved in more than 100 years. Most of these remain unsolved to date. These murder mysteries have been astonishing people from case to case. People have been wondering and building theories on their suspicion in most of the cases. Which of these murder cases scared you the most? We would like to hear from you in the comments section. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also, click the bell button so you can get notified when we release a new video. 
Thanks for watching.